you have a message for each person here today. And I pray that you will speak to every heart, that each one will hear what it is that you need for that person to hear. So that when they walk out, that's the message they will have heard. Not just me talking, but someone far more articulate than me, and that's your spirit. And Lord, I am so grateful. I'm grateful for Jesus. I'm grateful that we have this wonderful place, this wonderful time that we call Sabbath, where we can come and worship you as literally as the word Sabbath means, that we can stop and just think on you and be with you and be with family. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I if I had to pick uh, the happiest letter that Paul ever wrote, it has to be his letter to the church at Philippi. Really happy letter. It's such a jolly letter that one might imagine him writing it, I don't know, on the, the balcony of his sprawling villa. And maybe feasting on the boon of his successful publishing career. Maybe nibbling on some macaroons and sipping some iced tea. Sweet iced tea. Yeah. But no. No. Paul wrote his rosiest prose in a dank and dark Roman prison. Hoping that he was going to have his day in court. But he wasn't sure that was even going to happen. For sure he knew persecution. Remember, he knew it probably more intimately than about anyone. He knew how to dish it out. But then later he learned what it was after his, experience, uh, his conversion, what it was to be on the receiving end. He learned what it was like to be repeatedly beaten, imprisoned, stoned, mocked, shipwrecked, and even challenged by other believers. So in spite of all of that, Paul had the headspace still to write these words right here. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. And don't worry about anything. But in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God of God, which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, you got that, I hope. Rejoice. How many of you did some rejoicing this week? You see, Paul's solution to anxiety, to angst, to fear, to crummy prison food, is to pray always and to petition God with thanksgiving. And what do we get out of the deal? Well, he just said so. We get a peace. And you know the kind of peace he's talking about, the peace that passes understanding. Now, had Paul frosted his advice to the church at Philippi with, I don't know, a coating of bitterness, even a layer of loss, his readers, including us, would have given him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe even nodded in approval. But he doesn't do that. And, and sometimes I think we struggle to get it. So what is it? Is, is Paul punch drunk? Is he putting his best public relations uh, face forward here? I don't think so. I think as Paul has said elsewhere, God forbid. And what's more... The special sauce of his letter is gratitude to God. In all situations, the cynicism of the moment cannot hold up when it comes up against thanksgiving and joy. But where does this joy come from? Paul, after all, is, is not just writing in Rome. 
but he's actually writing in Emperor Nero's Rome. So yeah, this guy with the really ugly beard. Now, a fire had ravaged the empire's capital, Rome, and like all politicians, Nero needed a scapegoat, and he found one in this new cult called Christianity, Christian. So as Paul is writing, Nero has only just begun to round up and slaughter the young church. I love this Caravaggio piece. It's actually of the crucifixion of Peter. Not that I love that part. I just love, I think it's an amazingly good painting. But in the letter that Paul writes, Paul expresses hope of visiting the Christians not only in Philippi, but elsewhere. Never will. In fact, he'll visit no one. He'll remain in that foul Roman prison for four years and then finally be martyred, likely beheaded with a sword. And yet, and yet he writes, rejoice in the Lord always. So I hope you got that. Rejoice always. As a matter of fact, say that. Rejoice always. And such rejoicing comes only through a peace that passes understanding. And that sort of peace comes only from an intimate relationship with the Prince of Peace. Now, gratitude and its inevitable offspring, joy, are central to the devout Christian's resistance. Paul's call to rejoice is not a call to defeatism, and it's not a plea made out of weakness. The world can take our freedoms away, and I think you'd be blind if you don't see that already occurring today. But it can't take away our gratitude in Christ. To rejoice in the Lord is the most potent act of subversion, a complete rejection of the culture's attempt at reprogramming. great gospel song says ain't nothing gonna steal my joy gratitude is so much more than a bout of positive thinking it's the antidote for bitterness for hate for rage and for violence the world would have us weaponize our resentments into unrest rioting but gratitude it teaches us to make sense of our past, no matter how terrible it was. And it gives us purpose to now, no matter how hard it is right now. And it instills a hope in us for the future. It's no wonder that gratitude is one of the most universal concepts shared by every major religion and every faith group and even every secular self-help guru. Now, in 1945, one of my heroes in life, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, entered one of Stalin's many gulags as an atheist. Though a decorated war hero, he had committed the crime of having been taken prisoner by the Germans in World War II. Stalin never trusted the Soviet prisoners of war returning home, fearing that they might have been tainted by the West capitalism, even if it was at the butt of a rifle. And rather than welcomed home as a hero, Solzhenitsyn, like most Soviet prisoners, was arrested and sentenced to hard labor. And like his comrades, he struggled to understand his sentence. Now the obvious justice ravaged him and others. He feared he might even die because of it. Like so many others, he felt robbed of all hope. And then Solzhenitsyn took notice of one particular group that fully grasped why they were incarcerated. The Christians. He understood why Christians had been seized because the law was clear. You see, Solzhenitsyn, like all good Soviets, knew Marx's utopian atheism. You see, Karl Marx 
His loathing of religion infested all of his writings, like a, like a satanic vermin. And not, by the way, just the Communist Manifesto that he co-wrote with Engels. He, meaning Marx, loved to brag of his frequent blood, blood packs with the devil. In his poetry, and yes, believe it or not, Marx wrote poetry, he wrote this. Heaven I've forfeited, I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. And he wrote that words like that over and over again. To fully grasp Marx's philosophy, one must see his hatred of religion as a feature rather than as a minor postscript. He famously labeled religion as the opiate of the masses, meaning a kind of mind-numbing drug that prevented the working classes from rising up in revolution against the business-owning middle class. Religion, he believed, placated the people, softening the resentment necessary for the fight. Now, a Marxist literalist, Joseph Stalin, aimed to take him quite literally and to stamp out religion altogether. Far more ambitious than his ruthless predecessor, Vladimir Lenin, Stalin announced complete eradication of God within five years. So under Stalin, all Christians who would not in some way disavow God were either taken out and shot or less mercilessly, they were shipped off to the gulags. Now Solzhenitsyn could see how unlike the other prisoners, these Christians seemed. Devout Christians knew full well why they had been impounded. Their self-awareness gave them a sense of, of peace about their circumstance and a strength few others knew or showed. Most others periodically crumbled in despair or spontaneously just combusted with their own grievances. Many even devolved into madness. Christians on had sided with God over Stalin and felt such vindication in their choice. Their faith was bigger than the sparse land surrounded by barbed wire fences and guard towers, bigger than the enormous swaths of Siberian wasteland. In spite of real injustice, Christians had cause to rejoice. They felt a strength that could not be broken by hard labor and very little sleep. As a result, Christians lived longer and happier. Moved by such a devout faith, Solzhenitsyn left the work camp after eight years, a converted Christian. His Nobel Prize winning literature is a testament to the faith in God that the Christians had. Now, I'm going to segue from Solzhenitsyn to one of my favorite characters in literature. The beloved character, Pollyanna. Now, is that a segue or what? But Pollyanna is iconic among American stories. And her name has actually become kind of a, an adjective describing anyone... He was unusually optimistic. The original novel, Pollyanna, anyone read Pollyanna? Got a couple. Which came out in 1913, was actually followed by 11 sequels. But I don't think anyone captured it better than Haley Mills in the Disney film. But the original story speaks of an 11-year-old girl, Pollyanna, who was recently orphaned of missionary and she was then sent to a fictional town of Beldingsville, Vermont to live with her aunt, who was a stuffy woman who bullies her town with wealth and overbearance. Captured very well by an actress who was Ronald Reagan's first wife, by the way. Pollyanna could not be more unlike her aunt. 
intent on finding the good in every person and defeating despair with gladness. As a result of her cheerful charm, in every situation, the entire town has changed, including her aunt. Actually, I love this story so much because my wife and I, before we were wife and I, before we were in boyfriend and, and girlfriend, were watching this at my parents' house. And it was one of those moments where watching this happy movie in our hands started to move closer to each other. Until before it was done, I mean, we were playing the glad game together. So I'm telling you, I love Pollyanna. Ramsey, I don't even know if you would be if it weren't for Pollyanna. But you know, in today's culture, Pollyanna is a character to mock rather than emulate. However, I think she's been misread and mistaken and misused. To call someone Pollyanna-ish is to call that person a naively positive person. A, someone who's kind of childishly deluded. It's also to call that person sappy and irritating. But I call foul on that. Pollyanna is many things, but she is not a Pollyanna in the popular vernacular. She is, of course, optimistic and sunny at all times, but she's also a realist. Let me explain. By that I mean her secret is not to invent reasons to be glad, but for thinking of actual reasons that she has to be thankful. And glad. I think she's a realist. Now, the infectious joy that she has reminds me of others uh, who have that kind of joy about them. How many of you can think of a Pollyanna right now? I can think of a few. And that unstoppable joy amidst the worst and best of times is a subversive influence for good on the dour and despairing town and on any group of people we tried it on try it on but if i had to choose get ready for this segue if i had to choose the single most pollyanna individual in modern history i think it's anne frank maybe i'm thinking that because i recently just listened to the audio version of her famous diary and i have never felt so much joy. How many have read that before? Such joy in spite of real persecution. Anne's family lived in silence in secret rooms, cleverly hidden behind a bookcase. You can see it right here, behind a bookcase in the building where her father Otto worked. And I, I can't imagine a terror like theirs to be Jewish in Amsterdam at the height of Hitler's final solution. Remarkably, they actually remained hidden for just over two years. Thanks in part to, the, to their own courage, I think, and the goodwill of friends. But in the end, they were found out, and Anne died in Auschwitz in February or March of 1945, just a few months from the end of the war. One surviving friend, we think the last friend who actually saw her before she died, described her as so skeletal thin and sickly as to be unrecognizable at the end. I argue that the world is in young Anne Frank's debt for her joy. Hoping to be a writer someday, she kept a diary and filled it with joy. A remarkable person, indeed, who could look at her drab conditions and then write something like this. Think of all the beauty still around you and rejoice. With wisdom, I, I can't even imagine from any adult, let alone a girl of 15, she wrote this. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. You cannot convince me that her joy was in vain. She sustained her father, who was the only surviving family member. 
And if you think about it this way, she improved the world. Thus, to be a Pollyanna or to be an Anne is to be something of a heat-seeking missile going up against the culture of despair. And the world is in desperate need of such missiles of joy. Now, I say that with a little fear and trembling because I often get someone or someones who will gripe at warlike metaphor metaphors that work their way into a sermon, like a mighty fortress or God of angel armies, because that sounds a little warlike. So what must it sound like for me to call us to be heat-seeking missiles of joy? I'm sure I'll get an email. But truth is, few of us here know what it's like to suffer a Roman prison, a Russian gulag, or a German death camp. Few of us know real persecution, unless we're, we're referring to some irritating tweet or Facebook post we were forced to read. See, I can see somebody's really uh, felt the pain. Maybe persecution is when you go to Taco Bell or Chick-fil-A and they get your order wrong. You know, now that's persecution. However, not to sound overly dramatic, but I think our world is changing. We suddenly find ourselves immersed in a culture in which it is impossible to turn on the television without being mocked for our belief in Christ. Where Lucifer is a sexy problem solver and God is an incompetent bigot. And most folks around us think that's just fine. Even among Christians, traditional beliefs have been called quaintly embarrassing. We are immersed in a culture where the songs, you're such a ho, and wop, are regarded as female empowerment. Please, I don't want anyone going and like looking those up right now. And when we attempt to tell our kids, especially our daughters, otherwise, we're deemed as misogynists or haters. We find ourselves fearful of losing our businesses, our job prospects, our online pro platforms, or our friends if we espouse or defend traditional faith or even sticky passages of scripture. The message is clear. Shut your mouths, you fundamentalists, or we will shut them for you. We suddenly find ourselves in a culture with a mere act of celebrating Thanksgiving is a misdemeanor in some states. In more radical circles and cities and campuses, Thanksgiving is an act of bigotry against native peoples, as if the pilgrim's primary purpose in escaping religious persecution was actually, was actually genocidal ambitions. Actually, having been blown off course and landed far from their intended port, they were just trying to survive, and not always successfully. Incidentally, few, sorry to get off on a tangent here, but few recall how it was Abraham Lincoln who permanently enshrined Thanksgiving as a celebration to God, thanking him for a union's victory at Gettysburg. But then again, this is the year, 2020, where we're toppling statues like Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and Teddy Roosevelt and Susan B. Anthony and white Jesus. These gripes seem petty inconveniences, perhaps, compared to real persecution in the world. According to current world figures, more than 100,000 Christians each year are dying for the crime of being a faithful Christian more than at any time in history. Their deaths scarcely receive mention in our weirdly monolithic media. Our issues seem petty compared to that, but the response is the same. Rejoice. Rejoice. And those of us who 
just simply prefer to live and let live. We feel trapped by this. Most of us find no interest in meddling in the lives of others. We'd like to be left alone to just worship as we please, to celebrate and to associate as we please. The only recourse is to fight back with insurgent gratitude and subversive joy. Just as Paul recommends in his letter to the Philippians. And even in the midst of a world pandemic, amidst real suffering that many of you know, some of us here I know have lost friends and family this year. The prescription is the same. Rejoice. Rejoice always and be grateful. As Romans 5 tells us, we are grateful for our suffering because suffering gives us perseverance. Suffering gives us proven character. I like this version here, which produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I love that. So this holiday season, this Christmas season now we're entering, and by the way, it's now okay to put your Christmas decorations up. And those of you who put it up a little earlier, God bless you. <laughs> so this Christmas season now, let's go out and bolden each other and pierce this sick culture. He's prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And though the enemies of God would prefer, would prefer we all just shut our traps, let's praise Jesus in song, online, at the water cooler, at the dinner table, wherever you are right now, rejoice. Get on Facebook, if you're still on Facebook, get on Twitter, get on Parlor even. Get on your old AOL if you have to. Get on your old MySpace and rejoice in the Lord always. Open your door outside and take a walk and when you greet people, rejoice. Make your neighbors smile. And smile so big if you're wearing a mask that they can see your smile right through it. Rejoice. And then watch as the peace of God, the peace that passes all understanding, covers your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Pray with me. Father God, each of us is experiencing different things in life. Some of us are just in a season of joy. And may we thank you with more joy. Some of us this year, though, have known real pain and suffering. And may we rejoice. Some of us may yet experience what real persecution is. And in those times, may we rejoice. And then again, rejoice. May we be a people that infects this culture with your spirit of joy. And when people are around us, may they sense, as Solzhenitsyn did with the Christians in the Gulag, that there's something different about us because we have joy. May we be a kind of person like Anne Frank was who could find beauty in any circumstance and in her surroundings. May we be like the Apostle Paul who in any situation could say rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.